Um, I'm Maria Fedorchenko, or oh, most of you know me. I teach Diploma 6, and I'm going to present uh, the results of our short workshops that we run this week with Placat Platform, which is a platform I founded many years ago with several recent AA graduates, and we run a workshop every year at the AA to do provocations. So this year, we decided to focus on the theme of planetary imagination to respond to the AA Climate Week challenge. So we use the tools of the platform, the methodology that we've developed over many years in order to tackle the problem of the planet. But in a context where a lot of people are coming up with all kinds of solutions, green machines, cloud cities, uh, uh, you know, uh, different ways to deal with um, digital space of the environment and control and mitigate in many ways, we decided to go a different route. We tried to go with indirect response using the uh, tools of architectural imagination. Um, it means that we also align ourselves with a number of practices that are already called uh, that issue for us and said that we actually have to recover our ability to come up with ideas, come tell stories, so that we actually much more conscious of the planet and the all forms of climate inheritance we're gonna leave behind. We already had experience with that in the unit in the previous workshop, and we actually intensify that approach of the world as an architectural project. That means this year we asked the students to work from one or several uh, visionary case studies. We asked them to rethink them in the contemporary context. Could we recover their hidden latent environmental potential? Could there be actually engines for specking different futures? And so the students looked at the range of works from the nomadic and global cities to the different aerial and terrestrial devices that make up the spaceship Earth. We asked them to do something very simple, to rework the image and retell the story. So while the work is extremely um, raw, this was a one-week workshop um, with a leisurely lunch in between, um, and it's still kind of work in progress, so bear with me, but I decided today to share the work as a kind of a emergent themes that are beginning to cut across individual works. Some of these themes that would be familiar to you. Um, we're thinking, okay, climate is a disaster. So perhaps accelerating or staging deliberate disasters could actually fly in the face of our denial of the climate problem. Or perhaps we can think of different ways of approaching life cycles of the city and potentially rekill the obsession with mindlessly killing, but also infinitely reusing and recycle everything we can possibly find. And we also wanted to issue some caution with regards to technological solutions to our environmental problems. So here I go. First theme is about nature's turn. And they also starting to think about what kind of architectural figures the future archaeologists might find. Sometimes nature is the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about changing climate. And we all rush to save it. And some of our students decided to think that what if in a deliberate act of liberating nature, ground, we could actually begin to condense and remove architectural um, supports for living from the ground and string it along into, this case, Polish countryside on the outskirts of Krakow. What would end result is potentially a bizarre situation where you actually have a, a linear living uh, cities lifting off the ground and liberating the ground entirely of human uh, occupation. What would be then left behind? Would it be truly Garden of Eden, those Elysian fields we dream about? Or would it be an ecology truly out of whack? We spoke to a lot of Polish rabbits that day a lot. So that dark side of eco ecology out of balance is something uh, uh, we started to discuss quite seriously. The second serious issue that came up in this joking story is the issue of control. Architects always dream of controlling the world, controlling nature, controlling cities, controlling environments. But what if there are things we truly can't control? What if the onslaught of ecological disaster is something that breaks down all the apparata of our infrastructures of self-protection? In this extreme story, Palm tells us how humans, in a desperate attempt to control the spread of the desert, begin to con commit acts of ideological violence. They create potential barrier that fails so that this desert and its sands sweep around the ground, creating a forceful tabula rasa. The city retreats, forming a fortress in an attempt 
to cede the territory but protect the city. Then further installations take place. What are they? Those are hypertrophic infrastructures of the desert, but there are out of out of alliance and out of narrative with the city that came before. But then one day, if the desert were to be conquered and we were to be excavating the, both the previous and the post city, what, what sense would we make of a narrative? And more seriously, how could we begin to think about the planet as the surface on which we imprint the archeologies that the future humans will find? Okay, another extreme. If the earth and the desert of Almeria is not going to spread across the entire Europe, what if the opposite were the case? What if the great flood was already happened? And Damien tells us the story with the melting of all glaciers that already in, um, raised the sea level by 68.5 meters, which puts all the powerful cities of today in the state of Atlantis. The world of those cities becomes climate refugees. They're beginning to think how they're going to frantically save some remnants of our, uh, let's say, attachments to the architecture of the city, to load their ships of fools along with urban landmarks, interior fragments and microcosms, or records of collective events. Of course, this is truly futile compared to what we would then leave behind at the bottom of the planetary sea. But even with a much shorter time span, the anguish of what to kill and what to save is still with us. So, the second theme that I'm starting now is about life cycles of the city and the death drive architecture. Rallo tells us that if we learn from all the really wise visionary architects, we can assemble a perfect machine. This will curate the city, but it will also open up the possibilities of in intensifying the absurdity of what architects often propose on a, on a series of uh, disastrous sites, staging those micro disasters, so to speak. Revealing the horrors of very wasteful demolitions that would, would occur in the past, but also our obsession with preservation, maintenance, recycling, reuse, displacement, uh, and recasting of absolutely every material fragments we can scout. So that thing looms. It looms in the sense of weaving a hanging cemetery of Paris from the Paris it salvages, but it also looms there as a disastrous reminder of the horrors of the past. And then there were a couple of obviously much more prosaic questions. If these more mammoths of past architecture were to be left behind as islands of architecture in the city, how do we deal with them? Do we rewire them into the city? Do we leave them as monu monumental structures? And is, it, is there in fact a literal physical infrastructure that would be driven by environmental consideration and will be rearranging the relationship between historical fragments of the city and environmentally purified territory? Or is it ultimately about a uh, uh, more digital route? And what we would ultimately preserve is not architecture, but architectural minds, so that this memorial or city of brains would one day be able to remake our future after the apocalypse. Digital cities is about the tension between our hopes and fears of technological solutions, technological dreams and nightmares, if you will. Let's take the common misperception that by moving from physical to digital, we're actually being environmentally sophisticated architects. But as Greg reminds us, digital may be perceived as light, but is not actually sustainable. And in fact, we are also complicit from digital paperless studios to remote teaching, rapid prototyping with all kinds of unimaginable machines and a growing physical shadow looms with metal mines, post-human factories, data centers, server towers, internet exchange uh, point and other um, uh, growing IT infrastructures. The accumulating remains of these now digital cities, which are actually horrifyingly physical, could one day complete with our romantic ruins of cultural, industrial, and social spaces that we seemingly left behind. Now we can also consider that the growing digital support infrastructure is potentially a city, and what we're living in is not a city. So then we can begin to dream again about the ludic city of happy habitats, walking, plugging, floating, playing, dreaming, all in this centralized and hierarchical zero imprint world. 
But from the retreat from the data city, we might just lose our collective responsibility and caught into individualistic capsules and bubbles. Bubbles are, of course, not new. They're brought back from the post-war utopias. And if we look to the smart technologies today, we can actually begin to use the uh, technological gadgetry to help us geoengineer the planet, control climate, and potentially... Uh, radically change the environment of the city at macro, micro scales at the same time, this becomes quite a scary opportunity because with recent technological breakthrough, those aerial and rain and fire uh, blades and boundaries that the client might have only dreamt about could become real climate instruments. But we should be cautious, for they can also be exploited, leading to cities forcibly curated into clean and dirty halves, polarization based on climate exclusion and inclusion. Fictional conclusions can be offered from that for our own set of geo stories is often ironic and dark. We don't offer solutions, but we might just help you ask a few interesting questions. So if we consider for a second that what my students are telling me, the world, end of the world is no longer a cultural trope, it's a real possibility. And if we actually begin to conceive those mythical endings as imminent and real, then perhaps some of our RNA that includes rearranging chairs and wunderkammers on the Titanics and the true inability to save our worlds would come to the fore and we might just be able to change our narratives. Or if we make, unmake and remake architecture in a way that just doesn't work, then even rapid cleanup, recycling, and rearrangement of the debris may not be having that kind of um, holistic impact that we, would, we were hoping for. So perhaps, perhaps at least having monumental reminders of our uh, uh, era's uh, past would also be worth conceiving. And while we may be tempted to just write off our physical ruined cities and turn to those promising digital metaverses, maybe we shouldn't lay all hopes on technology to help us re-engineer, mitigate, magnetize, cool, filter, and otherwise fix climate symptoms. We might find ourselves in a world where the local governments and global corporations would charge us quite steeply for a breath of fresh air. With this, we leave you to ponder other stories and their endings. Thank you. Material scarcity, reuse, and resource efficiency. That's the future we're heading to. A future of few chairs. It's the title of the project. DIP21 is our government name, but we like, in this film, we like to call ourselves aliens, outsiders. We'll present a film about 13 beings from the future traveling to a world where precious materials are being wasted in front of our eyes. While you watch the film, we invite you to sit on a series of chairs built from found objects at the AA, 50% um, of which is last year's project's review. You might recognize some of, your, some of the wood that your project sat on. Um, as you sit on these chairs, we ask you to think about the aesthetics of reuse, mending, and messiness. Um, and if you don't, then you know, think about why you're choosing not to sit on the chairs. Um, and with no further ado, action.
<laughs> Thank you. Are, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I've been waiting for this. Like, generally, these are like <laughs> we need you guys um, because. I think we need to find a way to smile about the possibilities of the future a little bit. Um, and as creatives, you know, at our best, we inspire, we communicate, we persuade, it's really important, but also we articulate a dream for others to inhabit. And I think one of the things that we tend to talk about when we talk about climate crisis is all the things that will happen if we take no action. We tend to talk less about all the things will happen if we do take action. And to set that up as a dream to visualize so that we understand what the benefits, so we understand why we're, you know, why you would make a sacrifice for some of the things that might actually be really joyful. And I mean, the, obviously the chairs are a kind of prop, but I'm seeing it as a bigger conversation, right? Um, and it's like, you know, when you do sports psychologists do work with um, top sports people, one of the key things is to visualize winning. And I think we need to do a bit more of that. And the fact that you bring a smile and ability to kind of visualize some tiny fragment of winning, I think mm -hmm. is really nice. Thank you very much. I kind of wanted to even respond. I think we also need these conversations, like uh, even, even your question to Bernadette's presentation about Terra Nullis and the question about agency. I think Terra Nullis is it's an aesthetic, and um, and we need to respond to that aesthetic. Uh, Mary Douglas wrote in sort of Purity and Danger, this, the danger of that sort of aesthetic of cleanliness and what is that doing to our societies, and can we start reframing what we think is beautiful um, by, by thinking of something that's messy, something that's haphazard, something that's put together and not these like pristine chairs that are made out of plastic in a factory mass produced. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are gonna talk about design and make as a methodology to, to enhance the future of the built environment. For those of you who, who don't know, Design and Make is a postgraduate program based in Hook Park that many times here you, you forget a little bit about us. <laughs> so we are the ones studying out there in the woods and the room is full of Hook students. So <laughs> well, during yesterday's lecture about the wood love, they talked about Hook Park's forest 100 year plan. And it's crucial to understand that in Design and Make, our workspace is within a woodland. So we form part of a larger ecosystem. And our approach always focuses around utilizing resources available in the forest, aligning with this forestry planning. Uh, so therefore, the planning always like kind of guides or drives our work in a way. So it's vital to engage with these long-term forest cycles, which influence our decision making. So on one hand, we have Hook Park Forest. Uh, here we work with locally sourced natural materials without strictly depending on industrialized material options. And on the other hand, we also have technology. We learn from the material and let it inform our design. And we use technology mainly as a tool to enhance the potential of the wood. It's not about being fully technology dependent, but about creating a, a healthy synergy between both of them, the material and the technology. The design and make methodology has uh, three main principles that we, will be, that we will be mentioning throughout the, the presentation. The first one is material engagement. It's important to leave clear that we design with nature without forcing or manipulating it too much. 
and we strive to use all those parts of the tree that the industry usually discards. To give you an example, in broadleaf trees, approximately 50% of its volume is constituted by the crown and the leaves, being the remaining 50%, the trunk and the stump. And the percentage of the tree potentially used by industry is really low. It's only about the 30%, that is basically the trunk. And in design and make, we try to employ the most of each tree we fall. The goal is to decrease the amount of wastage and put in value the normally discarded elements. Our process of design is a continuous conversation with the wood material itself, where, in, where engagement like emerges organically. In this picture, we are extracting a beech fork, which nature already designed for us. And it already has integrated really valuable aspects like the strength, the organic curves, the biophilic aspect of afterwards when seeing it installed inside a building, we are kind of transferred to the forest, let's say. So this becomes like a material library with forks of different sizes, angles of openness, tones. And unlike most architects who work with wood, uh, Unlike most architects who work with wood, our material catalog, it's not in a brochure or in a web page, but it's the forest itself. We need to understand these natural shapes that we are working with and how they perform in nature in order to afterwards work with them in our buildings. In this particular project that we are showing some images, these forks are being used as columns. And as you can see, every piece of the forest is unique and nature has already done like quite a lot of the design job. The, the connection with the, with the material is done also in a wide range of, of ways and wide range of workflows from manual to technological. For instance, when we get a, a potential piece for, from the forest, uh, one of the th first things we do after doing the debarking as the photo shows is making a photogrammetry or a lighter scanning of the piece in order to have it uh, in 3D, to have the digital model, and being able to operate with it uh, with more precision. So to, con to continue with the three principles of design and make, the second one I I'd like to show and talk about is research through practice. We have a strong connection to fabrication and practical design, regularly testing the details and connection through one-to-one -one prototypes. We do this to foster efficiency and inform the design by learning from the limits of the, of the own material. We improve our resolutions through investigation and many, many iterations. So we are constantly innovating with the material and the design. For example, uh, we can combine different species of wood to create more efficient synergies between connections, structural requirements and architectural design. By understanding and mastering the characteristics and properties of the material, we can improve their technological capabilities and applications. In this case, we take the non-conventional pieces of wood to its limits. And also by doing this, in addition, the material informs the technology we use. And for instance, we negotiate the limits of the robot and the technology and develop different innovative tools to attach to the tip and adapt to the design and the production requirements that we need. This research and testing also involves manual procedures, of course, which many times require a lot of people helping. Uh, so this overlaps with the third principle of, of design and make, which is collective making. They are constantly overlapping. This is a, a cyclical uh, methodology. Uh, in our determination of using this, the available resources that we have, uh, the species that we have at Hook Park, the, the length of the woods, etc. We need to manipulate some of these pieces, creating engineered timber that responds to specific internal forces and geometries. We are not exempt to gravity and engineer forces, etc. This is determined by the architectural design and the one-to-one uh, the -one work with engineers as well. We inherit, it's also important to mention that we inherit a bunch of techniques and manufacturing systems from those who came before us. 
uh, and we continuously explore new and innovative methods. We talk with the students that came before us, we talk with staff, we work together as a team. And we speak through the objects, articulating a multitude of potential concepts and ideas. And that, that's how we end up with better results. The third principle that, we, that I already mentioned, it's all about this embracing collaborative thinking. We embrace the traditional knowledge and we put it together with our own research and technological technology to achieve more resourceful buildings. We take the challenge to design for the future with the specific constraint of, in this case, only using local wood without any industry manufacturing material. So also we, we don't just design, we manufacture, we assemble and we build. With Tim Hook Park, we possess the tools to actively engage in timber production, shaping components that are intrinsically informed by the method of production. So, well, to, to finalize, we want to highlight how our, our projects make use of almost every part of the tree. In this prototype of a structural axis, we used discarded tree stumps for the foundation bases, the tree, the tree forks, as I showed, for the columns, conventional timber planks for the cords and the glue and pieces that are above the forks, and small branches to create the web members of the trusses. Also, also it's important to remember that we are very conscious that this is a cyclical procedure. While we harvest from the forest, it's equally essential to replant, ensuring the preservation of the ecosystem and securing resources for the generations to come. Let's take the 100-year plants for Hook Park as an example of a unit of measurement bigger than us and our children to, in, to understand which things are really important. Moreover, we wanted to leave some open questions for you uh, to think about. The first one is how this same methodology could be applied to other materials, to other non-standard natural materials, such as clays, stones, or straw? We, we learned this week that our best option is to pursue mixed tree forests, for example, to have more resilient ecosystems. In climate change, if climate change is so inevitable that we have been through a whole week of ideas around it, why are we not investing more time and effort in making things differently? Let's stop speculating with the future if we, if we aren't able to master the current challenges of the world we live in. Also, we talk about how to be more responsible and adapt to what nature provides. This seems to be in a clear opposite way to the current capitalist model ruled by big industries that determine how we should do architecture in catalogs. But why should we do or go against this? To tell, to be more resilient perhaps, to give the society that that only architects can provide, a special, a special just, justice, or if you prefer simply because now we have the technology to do it without unnecessary waste and ridiculously excess on transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you were talking about a relationship between designers and fabricators. I'm not pointing fingers, but I didn't see you two in many of the photos. But anyway, we can talk about that later. I, it's okay. You don't have to. You don't have to lie. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I was really curious about how you think this is going to, how a different model of architecture might exist, and how you think you might use this in the future once you graduate. I was kind of curious how you how you feel this is going to change like the changes needed in models, like in practice and how you think you'll personally change how you do things? Well, first of all, through discussion, like I think uh, many of the groups here are very conscious that we need to start talking about real things and real problems. Um, second, through academia, this is a perfect place to, to talk about this and what, what can we actually do from our point like from our like position as architects no what can we give to the world it's this notion of, of uh, a special control and what what can what do we need to remember is our role as um, designers and makers or designers and builders perhaps that it was more our role in the past 
Now we have been shifted apart from making and building just through ideas of authorship and just designing and drawing a drawing. But we need to engage to the material and we need to understand what we are doing. So to be responsible with that, uh, we can do it in practice as well by giving this information to clients, by discussing this with other architects and just questioning why are we designing with a Revit block or something that is not designed through like a very thoughtful idea of what's the impact that this is doing in the world. It's just to make someone else like earn more money, you know? So it doesn't make sense. It's just, we need to discuss it more. Good. Anyone else? Here you go. What's the ideal age of a tree that you start to consider it for structural purposes? I mean, obviously it'll vary between different species. Sure well, yeah, there are many constraints, uh, mainly the species that determines the, the, the age. There is, I don't know, better. But um, this uh, ideal age hasn't been defined by architects. They, they were defined by what moment in the tree life uh, time it's going to be more profitable. No? So the trees that we are using are either like small or just crooked or just, they're not like very like perfect tree. No? So we actually walk in the forest and try to find these trees that with some constraints for us is perfect, but maybe it's, it's difficult to chop or it's too big already or it's too small or it's a bit sick because some plague or whatever. And we can work with it. No? So that's more like the way of how we work with the trees instead of the other way around. I'm, I'm going to have to, sorry, I'm going to have to, I'm just going to have to, we have to move on to our next presenters. Can I just have a quick, um, if you're a designer make student, can you put your hands up? So I've been told that designer make students want to be asked lots of questions, so please go and find them and, and grill them later on. But thank you very much <laughs> for your presentation, guys. We are students from AADRL, Design Research Laboratory, and we, have, we are here to present our research methodology of Elemental, how we focus on phenomenons and use that as technology to sustain life, harvest energy, and uh, a new way of thinking and making and designing uh, a system, a prototypical system.